Good morning, church family, and good morning to all of our guests. You are our special guest today. We're so glad to have you. If you moved to our congregation the last year or so, and you're saying, who was that song leader this morning? Well, he's Everly's grandfather. And my oldest granddaughter is here today, Sophia, and we're so glad to have all of our family and grand family here today. Yes. All right. We are in an exciting sermon series on fundamentals. There is nothing more fundamental we're going to talk about today. We talk about fundamentals. We talked about that every successful endeavor has to remember their fundamentals and to keep their fundamentals. And when you talk about fundamentals of Christianity, Jesus laid them down in what's called the Sermon on the Mount. He began by saying the true blessings the Beatitudes that are to be ours, that we're going to be His. That we have to be before we do. Then we ask the question, so many young people today are asking, what is church? So in the book of Ephesians, we have the fundamental concepts of what the church is all about. In a book written on the book of Ephesians by Watchman Nee, he called it Sit, Walk, and Stand. Because actually, that's it's the three postures that are in the book and are even given in the book. We sit in heavenly places in Christ. We walk with Christ, and we stand with Christ. He began by saying we need to sit down and remember the deity, the trinity. Chapter 1, how God works in our lives, how Jesus works in our lives, how the Spirit works in our lives. And how, in chapter 2, that we were sinners until Christ died upon the cross and we became saved through him by his amazing grace, the obedience of faith and baptism, were added to his church family, Ephesians 3, which is the manifold wisdom of God. This is what God envisioned when he made Adam and Eve in the garden. This is the kingdom of God on earth that will be the kingdom of God in heaven. Then in Ephesians chapter 4, he talked about the importance of unity of this one great body. Then in chapter 5, he went from sitting to walking. And we saw last week in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 through 6, we're to walk in love one toward the other. In 7 through 14, we're to walk in the light of his word. And then in 15 through 17, we're to walk very carefully, circumspectly. Today, we're going to talk about walking in harmony. Now, what does that mean? To walk in harmony, he says in Ephesians 5 and verse 18, be not filled with wine where there is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Just like those who indulge themselves in alcoholic drinking, they get completely absorbed by it. We're to be absorbed by the Lord by his spirit what does it mean to be filled or to walk in his spirit well Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 17 tells us in that sermon he talks about the armor of God that the sword of the spirit is the word of God when you and I read the spirit filled God word and we try to live by his word we walk in his spirit that's the instrument of the Spirit. Now, this is not the Holy Spirit, but this is His instrument. And when we follow His instrument, we walk by the Spirit. By doing that, Romans 8 says, then His Spirit bears witness with our spirit. If people see us walk and how we live, that we are children of God. You receive that Spirit when you are baptized into Christ, Acts 2, 38. Now, what does it mean to walk in that Spirit in everyday life? That's what today's lesson is all about. The three most common concepts in our lives, marriage, parent-child relationship, and employer-employee relationship. So you haven't already. Now you're turning to Ephesians chapter 5. And we'll begin reading now at verse 21. Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear or the respect or the awe of God. Listen very carefully. If you don't hear anything else, be sure you get this. 
when we're talking about walking in the spirit in our marriage in the spirit in our parent-child relationship and in our employer-employee relationship we're talking about giving up our control and making him the controller of our marriages of our homes and of our workplace who's in control in your marriage submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God that's what we're talking about today he is the head he has divine roles for us to play it's his plan and then we know today marriage is really being challenged today but it will work if you work it and here it is it's all about submission first of all verse 22 wives submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord that's why I have premarital counseling with folks before they get married to hopefully they can get on the same page with Holy Writ because you really can't understand marriage until you understand the Lord how can a wife obey this when she doesn't even know the Lord but when she becomes a Christian and she knows how she's given herself to the Lord and now the Lord is the Lord of her life and now he directs her life that's how the husband is to be to her wives submit yourselves unto your own husbands as you do to the Lord you mean I give up my independence yes you mean I give up what I want to do yeah a lot of times it's sacrificial you said I do I take you to be my husband I take you to be the man of our house it means completely keep reading with me for the husband is ahead of the wife because God put him in that position even as Christ is ahead of the church and he's the savior of the body none of us feel inferior or feel we're being made to be a Christian it's all voluntary submitting is voluntary therefore as the church is subject unto Christ so let the wise be to their own husbands in everything in everything now how can a wife submit to a man that completely that voluntarily that sacrificially because he has now God's word on his role in this endeavor husbands love your wives even as Christ loved the church now how much did the Lord love the church he gave himself for it but I've heard more than one husband say oh I would die for my wife I just can't live with her you may laugh at that but that's not funny you hear me if you would give your life for her then you can live with her and love her with all your heart husbands love your wives even as Christ loved the church gave himself for it and he might set it apart cleanse it with the washing of water by the word the husband is proud of his wife he puts her on the pedestal that he might present to himself a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing but it should be holy and without blemish we're talking about giving his life for her that's life love now he talks about if you don't get that one your body love look at verse 28 so ought men to love their wives as their own bodies oh I don't love myself do you take care of yourself what do you mean do you get three meals a day yeah you make sure you got a place over your head clothes on your back money in your pocket do you go where you want to go do what you want to do yes you love yourself now love your wives that way for no man ever yet hated his own flesh 
but nourish and cherish it even as the Lord the church. The Lord loved the church sacrificially, completely, and voluntarily. For we are members of his body and of his flesh and of his bones. And this is what it says. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. Jesus did it for his church. We do it and we say, I do. And if you want your marriage to work, it's just this simple and it's just this profound. Verse 33. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself and the wife that she respects her husband. There it is. Fundamentals about the marital relationship. Now, what about the parent-child relationship? Mom, dad, and the kids. You listen to children? Listen up now. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. We live in a generation of people who don't know what is right. It used to be an expression, do the right thing. What is that? Where am I going to get information on doing the right thing? From some kind of magazine on the counter? On television? On the internet? Where am I going to find the information to do the right thing? There's only one place. It's the Word of God. Children are to be taught the Word of God as soon as possible. Even in the womb, you can talk to your child about Jesus. Knowing the Lord, marriage in the Spirit, child-parent relationship in the Spirit. Obey your parents as the Lord would have you do, children, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. It just gives me chills. I don't know about you. I don't know how any parent today can really allow their children to watch very many cartoons today. Everyone I'm seeing is putting down the parents. The children have all the answers. The parents are the dumb ones. How can you honor your mom and dad when they're put down like that? Watch what your children are watching. Listen to what your children are listening to. Honor your father and mother. Well, my mom and dad sometimes don't do what I want to be done. Sometimes they don't treat me the way I feel like I should be treated. You honor them for the position they are in your life. That's your mother and that's your father. Martin Luther was the great reformer of his day, and he was a preacher. But he said he had a hard time calling God father because he had such an abusive father. And that would be very tough. But when you understand God the Father, and if you want to get a copy of last week's sermon, we talked about on Father's Day the kind of father God is. That's the kind of father that godly fathers want to be. Then you understand what we're talking about here. If your father's trying to be a godly father, honor him for that. If he's your father, honor him because he is your father. She is your mother because you're honoring the Lord. You're serving the Lord. That it may be well with you and that your days may be long on the earth. So the idea is to honor and to obey. Now, you remember Spock? Live long and prosper. Remember that? Well, that's from Bible. You will live long, generally speaking, and prosper, generally speaking, because you've learned as a child to honor and to respect authority. Parents, that's our job to teach our children to say yes, ma'am, and yes, sir, and to do what they're told by authorities. I know that's not popular today. I know it's not being done across the board in the world, but it's being done by marriages and by homes that are walking in the Spirit. You see how this works? Listen to what he says. There may be well with you, and that you may live long on the earth. Well, what about the parent? Fathers, parents, don't frustrate your children. And we all have done that. 
about being inconsistent. How many times we told our child, don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. For the fourth time, don't do, I'm going to count to three. How inconsistent can we get? What does don't do that the first time mean? Don't do that. That's what it means. Do that. What does that mean? Do that. Just be that consistent. Then your child knows not to do that. To do that. When the child doesn't do it after the first time, you apply the Board of Education to the seat of learning. <laughs> now, we're not talking about abuse. We're just, how do you train dogs? Don't do that. Oh, ah. You know what our children have learned? If at first you don't succeed, cry, cry again. <laughs> oh, they're crying, so give it to them. They'll be doing that when they're also 25. No. Yes. And when you apply the Board of Education to the seat of learning, you then hug them and tell them, I love you. It, it hurts. It does. Now, kids say, yeah, right. It does hurt us more than it hurts you, but it really does. We don't want you to cry, but if you will cry now because you've learned a lesson, you won't cry later in life when you haven't learned that lesson. So listen very carefully, parents. The Bible says, children, obey your parents. Parents, take care of your children. Don't frustrate them by being not there. Absentee fathers, absentee mothers, they're not there. We saw about, about last week, the only quality time you have as parents is quantity time. The more time you have with them, and I'm telling you right now, when they leave the home, you say, I wish I had spent more time with them. Okay, how much time you spend with them? But quality time is quantity time. It takes time for those teachable moments when you're there, and you can nurture them, and you can admonish them. Nurturing means you're bringing them up, and you're saying, that's good, and that's right, and admonish them. That's wrong. Don't do that. In the Lord. It's all about the Lord. It's all about walking in the Spirit. And then employ your employee relationship. Boy, if you really want to see something different on the workplace, just act like a Christian. That's really different in the workaday world. Listen to what he says to us here. You can exchange the words servants and masters, employee, employer. Employees... Be obedient to them that are your masters, or employers, according to the flesh, with awe and respect and trembling, in sincerity of your heart, as unto the Christ. I can't tell you how many employers I, I run across who tell me, we've got all kinds of jobs now offered for our young people. For the summertime, they can't find young people that are dependable. Oh, they're willing to get paid, but they don't show up during the week. And they don't do when they're there. They're lazy. That's our job, folks, as parents, to teach them that work ethic, to teach them this, that when we go, we give an honest day's work for an honest day's pay. Servants. Employees, be obedient to them that are your masters. Who are you tell me what to do? I'm the one that <laughs> hired you. Authority. According to the flesh, with fear and trembling and sincerity of your heart, as unto Christ. Why am I doing that? Even though he may be a harsh boss, he may be an ungodly kind of person, and he's even laughing at you for doing it when everybody else won't do it around him. But you're doing it. You're the only employee doing it. Because I'm serving the Christ. Do you hear me? Young people, older like, you're serving the Christ. And what does he deserve? The very best will be God. Not with eye service as men pleases. You've seen those people. 
They're all goofing around until the ball's cut around the court. Oh, they're going to work. Don't be that kind of worker. But as employees of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. He's our CEO. We're serving him with all of our heart. I'll guarantee you, you won't, you won't have a, t- a problem finding a job if you're that kind of worker. And your resume and those people they call to see what kind of person you are, they're going to rave about you. Oh, I wish I had 10 of them. With good will, doing service as unto the Lord and not to them. You're serving the Lord. You're walking in the Spirit. Knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall be received of the Lord, whether it be bond or free. God's going to reward you. It's a great day coming. And you employers do the same thing unto them. What does that mean? The same thing. So go back to verse 5. Employers, be obedient to them that are your employees in the sense of serving their needs according to the flesh with fear and trembling, with sincerity of your heart as unto Christ. For with eye service as men please, no, but as employees of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. So employers are also serving the Lord. He says that now in verse 9. Do the same thing unto them, forbearing, threatening. You don't have to threaten when you're the right kind of boss. You say again, this is what our employees are expected to do. And if they don't do it, you don't count to three. Well, they did it at home. (laughs) See what we did for them at home? We don't count to three on the job. If you don't do it, you're fired. And you learn a lesson that way. Not threatening, knowing that your master also is in heaven. You're serving God. And so you're the understanding employer. You're ex- you explain to them exactly what you de- want from them, exactly what you want from them. And then when they do that, you praise them, you pay them, you give them promotions. And you're the kind of boss everybody wants. And you're the kind of employee everybody wants. And by the way, if you're that kind of employee, you end up being a boss pretty quick. Employers also, they're in heaven. Neither is there respect of persons with them. You don't have favorites, and everybody has favorites, unfortunately, even in the home. We read about in the Old Testament about trying to have favorites with Jacob and Esau and so forth. No, you treat everyone the same in the Lord. We all submit to the Christ. So, employers or employees, You have a work integrity. You are one who, from the heart, works for the master. You're the one who is in every way doing what the Lord says. So, integrity, industry, because you're serving the Lord. And as employers, you treat them with respect. You pay them their due because you're serving the Lord. That's what we're talking about today. You say, does that really work? It works if we work it. It won't work in a day. Rome wasn't built in a day. Your marriage wasn't built in a day. Your home's not built in a day. And your work ethic's not built in a day. But you do it day by day by day. Every one of us should constantly be working on our marriages. How? How? that we might both walk more in the Spirit, not in the flesh. We're working day by day in our parent-child relationship. We don't walk in the flesh. We walk in the Spirit. Our home's not like anybody else's home because we're walking in the Spirit. Our marriages aren't like other people's marriages because we're walking in the Spirit. And on the job, you're different from every other employee there and every employer you've ever seen because you're walking in the Spirit. Let me tell you something. When we do that, we're going to have happy marriages. We're going to have happy homes. We're going to have happy employees and employers. What we're going to have is a world that sees us as the light 
and we make the difference. You must be spiritual. You must be a Christian. I want that in my life. Today, if you say, I want that in my life, if you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, are you willing to repent of all your past sins? It means, I don't want to live that life anymore. If you want to confess him as the Son of God, if you want to be baptized, have all your sins washed away, then this morning it can happen. We have the battery already ready behind the screen. The water's ready. Clothes ready for you to change into. We can baptize you into Christ right now. And you can go out as a child of God, as a Christian husband, Christian wife, Christian father, Christian mother, Christian young person. And the Bible says even one in the home makes that home a Christian home. You sanctify the home by your Christianity. And you make a difference. It works if it's worked. If you haven't been living the Christian life like you should, your marriage, your home, your workplace, and you want to come forward for the prayers of the congregation to pray with you, to have more strength to be that Christian you want to be, we're here this morning to do that. I'm deadly serious. This is the fundamental Christian life. Will you come?